Welcome back. Recall that we were working through the fundamentals of satellite navigation, and we had broken it into the five parts. One, six, satellites, we've talked about that. Navigation message, we've talked about that. Navigation signals, we just finished that. And now we go on to pseudo-ranging. And pseudo-ranging is the essential description of the measurement made by the user equipment. It's a gorgeous concept, and uh, uh, hopefully I'll do it justice. Here's a look at the measurement we've already talked about, the correlation operation associated with uh, the incoming signal called received, which we could just as well call incoming. Let me add that uh, alternate description, incoming. And the replicas are internal to the receiver. So the goal is to align the internal replicas with the incoming real signal from the satellite. And I hope you appreciate that once we get those aligned, we really have a very good measurement of the arrival time of the incoming because the replicas are timed or synchronized to the receiver clock. So that's the idea, to cause the receiver clock to make a mark on the incoming signal. And then we'll compare that mark made through this correlation operation to the timestamp put by the satellite on the signal in the navigation message. So that's really the essence of pseudo-ranging. That's how we're trying to measure time of arrival through this correlation operation minus time of transmission, which is the stamp marked by the satellite on the navigation message. That difference of time, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, whatever it is, times the speed of light is the pseudo range. So let's build that. So here we have the incoming, here are the replicas. And notice that uh, uh, we tend to try and put one right promptly uh, on top of the incoming. And then we have two shoulders uh, one is the early replica, a little bit early, and then the late replica, a little bit late. Notice that they're not even late by a whole chip, just a fraction of a single chip. So this contrasts our earlier view graph where we were just trying to find the signals very roughly in, their, in where, where they were located in terms of time delay. Now we've got a pretty good notion, and now rather than trying to acquire the signal, we're trying to track it. We're just following it around as that range, as that pseudo range varies up and down. And so the prompt, when multiplied by the received, here's the multiply, then we average over maybe a second or so, gives us this maximum correlation. And we call correlation the measurement of likelihood. We're trying to not only put a correlation replica at the peak, we're trying to straddle the peak. And really the action of the receiver is to move this family, late prompt early, back and forth so that the late correlation is equal to the early correlation. So we just difference those two and try and move the replica family back and forth such that that difference is always equal to zero. That's the action of the GPS receiver. Well, here's another picture of the same thing. The satellite stamps the transmission time. The receiver measures the arrival time. And uh, we can add a little bit of notation. Call this time of transmission. And down here, we call this time of arrival. Now, just to look ahead a little bit, the big challenge will be, of course, to make those measurements properly in the first place, but then to accommodate the fact that the time of arrival is measured with a different clock than the time of transmission. So if we looked at multiple satellites, they would be synchronized to each other through the action of the ground control segment that we talked about several snippets ago. So the time of transmission you can regard that as being at all, all of those times of transmission are being controlled in the GPS system time. 
but the time of arrival, that belongs to the very inexpensive clock in the GPS receiver, and so it will be biased, offset, relative to satellite time. But we're getting ahead of the story. Let's move through it more patiently. Here it is as an equation. Here's the time of transmission. Here are the chips going out of the satellite. Sometime later, those same chips arrive at the user, and the user marks that arrival time as time received, and the satellite marks the transmission time as time transmit. And if time received and time transmit were both measured in absolute time, or GPS time, we could simply write the true travel time was the difference, which is equal to the distance between the satellite and the user, divided by the speed of light, and we would be done. And with that distance, we would be able to go back to our macro understanding of our situation and say, well, that distance defines a sphere around that satellite. If we were to look at all of the points that we could be located at, given that we were distance d from a given point, that would be a sphere. Now here in two dimensions, rather than talking about a sphere, we say all of the points located at distance d away from the satellite define a circle. And so you'd think, oh, we're good. The story is, has begun. Uh, that must mean that our user is located at, at that black dot somewhere on the surface of the Earth here. Let's make such a measurement to another satellite. And so here we're doing exactly that. Notice green is the second satellite, red is the first satellite. And uh, the two lines of position overlap at the black dot, which is the true location of the user. Those two circles do also uh, overlap out here, but that's pretty far out in space, so we can discard that point with reasonable confidence. And so it would seem then in a, this two-dimensional problem that the user has been un ambiguously established to be located here, uh, north of Hudson Bay. Let's see what happens. Consider the possibility that the user clock is fast. So, for simplicity, assume that the satellites transmit at exactly 12 o'clock, and that it takes one minute to reach the user so our expected arrival time to enforce these two lines of position would be 12.01. But the user clock is fast. And so at 12.01, it's actually saying 12.02. Well, that makes us think that these ranges are not the nice ones that we have here, but they're in fact longer. So rather than being associated with D, we would go out to a greater distance simply because the user clock is fast. So it's reporting 12.02 or maybe 12.01 and 10 seconds rather than 12.01 and 0 seconds. So therein lies the challenge. By the way, if it were the other way around, if the user clock is slow, so it's not measuring 12.01, it's measuring 12 and 45 seconds, then all the ranges would appear short. And as we seek the intersection between those two ranges, we would be getting large errors in our estimated position. And that's the challenge. So let's go back to our equations. Remember, we have the code being broadcast by the satellite, received by the user. And what we've done is we've embellished our equations, the one at the top, still assume that both those measurements received and transmit are made in true time or GPS time, 
in any event a common agreed time. But what we've done here is a T user isn't actually synchronized to that ideal time where we measure T receive. And there's a bias, BU. And so in the case of my example where I was talking about uh, the clock was reading 12.02 rather than 12.01, the bias is that one minute offset between the user clock and true time. Or in that case where I said, no, 12 minutes and 45 seconds rather than 12.01, then BU is equal to minus 15 seconds. This is a big deal. We don't have any control over the user clock. It's very inexpensive. It only costs 50 cents. It, it's going to be off by several minutes every day. So one way or another, we have to account for this. And what we do in GPS is called state augmentation. So the state are those things that you solve for. And what we would have liked is just to solve for x, y, and z, our location. We began this course as navigators, as people who wanted to know our position, and so we would have been happy with a three-dimensional position. Sometimes people will write latitude, longitude, and altitude rather than x, y, z, but it's the same story. Those are three unknowns. In the case of GPS, you have to augment this. You will write this as x, y, z, and b, u. In other words, GPS works in a four-dimensional space rather than a three-dimensional space. And we're fortunate because that b, u, even though it means we have to solve for a fourth state, at least BU doesn't change from satellite to satellite to satellite. If it did, we would end up with so many additional unknowns that we would never be able to solve for them. So when we see four there, our immediate feeling is that we need at least four satellites in view. Four unknowns means that we need four equations to solve for them. And so that's really where we stand with GPS. And let's take a little bit more of a look at it down here at the bottom. Here's TU, inclusive of the bias, minus T transmit. And this is our first appearance of the pseudo range. Because it's the right-hand side is not only equal to distance, but it's distance biased by this unknown clock offset, hence the name pseudo. So going back to GPS, if we're uh, working a two-dimensional problem, uh, then we need at least three satellites because we have to solve for two dimensions of unknown location in this simple illustration. One dimension might be x, the other one might be y, and then we also have to solve for b. So that's why we now have red, green, and purple as the satellites of interest. And the GPS receiver can be thought of as that box which adjusts its time offset, B, BU, I guess is what we've done more formally. It adjusts BU until the three lines of position intersect at a point. When that nice event occurs, the receiver knows that not only has it solved for its location, that will be at the intersection of the three lines of position, but it has also solved for the user clock offset relative to GPS master time. So this is one of the stunning and amazing things about GPS. I uh, pray that you can hold on to it. GPS is more expensive 
than a true ranging system because you do need that additional satellite in view to solve for time. But having done that, you get a bonus. Not only do you know where you are, you know exactly what time is in the GPS frame. So there are a tremendous number of GPS applications that don't use XYZ at all. They're only interested in that time estimate. So uh, the rest of the picture reminds us that we uh, adjust the user clock until the lines of position agree. Uh, and that, by the way, is not how it's mechanized. We'll come by, back to how it's mechanized later on. And the view graph suggests that with four satellites, we're always in clover. That's not true either. If they're close to each other in space, they don't have much value. So to guarantee that they're nicely spread across the heavens, we very often hope for and seek seven or eight satellites in view just to make sure that we can do a good job of this. Here's the summary on pseudo-ranging. Please enjoy these four equations. Uh, the, this is the pseudo-range to satellite one, pseudo-range to satellite two, pseudo-range to satellite three, satellite four. In general, we denote the satellite number as a superscript. The idea is, is that the satellite is up above us, so that would be the more reasonable place to put the index for the satellite number. <clears throat> and the right-hand side is equal to distance. Notice that I have obliterated the uh, dimensional correctness in the sense that tau kind of suggests time measured in seconds, and here immediately I have something that's a distance measured in meters. And it is um, a, a traditional compaction in the navigation community to blur time and distance together. The understanding is that the speed of light for sure has to be inserted to make these equations dimensionally correct. But just for compactness and ease of understanding and, and reading, uh, we, we don't put the speed of light everywhere. So distance is now written in a Euclidean fashion. X u, y u, z u is the location of the user. X super one, y super one, z super one is the location of the satellite. So recall your Euclidean formula for distance x u minus x1 squared plus y u minus y1 squared, et cetera, all square root of that is the distance between those two points defined at those two Cartesian locations. In addition, we have the fourth state, estimanda. We're going to have to solve for that as well. B1 is the error, any residual error, in the transmission time of satellite one relative to the GPS master clock. So uh, for most of this discussion, we're just going to subsume that in this general error term out here at the end, epsilon. So this first expression means that you need to know the ephemeris of the satellites very co correctly. That's what provides x1, y1, z1. You need to know the ephemeris describing the satellite clock. That's b1. You have to manage these other errors, whatever they are. We'll talk about them more later. You have to make them very small. We hope for this to be less than one meter in terms of measurement uh, errors. And then, having gotten some information from the satellite, managed these errors with a plethora of techniques that we'll touch on later on, you solve for the four remaining equations for x, y, y, u, z, u, and b, u. Those are the four unknowns. You may lament and say, well, it's not a linear system of equations. We have all these square roots and squares. And I would have to agree, that does make things more complicated. But we will teach you how to linearize these equations and, in fact, solve for the four unknowns based on four linear equations. That's all for this snippet. I hope it uh, went well for you. <laughs>